name is Thomas, age 46. Symptoms, slowness of gait, asymmetrical tremor in his right arm, minor sleep impairments accompanied with what he calls brain fog. Today, we're here with Thomas at the University of Michigan operating room. He's gonna be undergoing a procedure called deep brain stimulation. We're gonna drill two holes into his head while he's awake and insert electrodes like this six inches into the center of his brain. They're gonna fire small electrical impulses into the centers that have become uncoordinated over the progression of his disease as the dopamine cells in his brain have prematurely died off. This should be highly therapeutic to Thomas as it has been to thousands of others. Imagine trying to eat a bowl of soup. Your arm is shaking so hard that by the time you bring the spoon to your mouth, there's nothing left in it. We're gonna fix that for Thomas today. He'll eat soup again. But the ironic thing about it all is we don't really know why this works. You see, in the 1940s, there was a neurosurgeon removing a tumor from a patient with Parkinson's disease, and he accidentally skipped a little piece of brain with his scalpel, took it offline. They called off the procedure, expecting the worst. But as the man came to out of anesthesia, what they found was that he was better. You see, these electrodes, they act as reversible scalpels for us. And so what we do today is not much different than what happened during that accident in the 1940s. But like I said, we don't quite know what it is about that small piece of brain that's so important. It reminds me of this quote by Isaac Asimov. Most important phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, but that's funny. The brain is one giant electrochemical circuit, and the wiring is often Thomas. Now listen to those words that I used, electro, circuit, wiring. This is an engineering problem. We're trying to figure out what happened to that giant circuit atop Thomas's neck. It's the jobs of the engineers in the room to understand what went wrong and what it is about deep brain stimulation that's fixing it. What we want is a circuit diagram to inform therapies and give us clues towards cures. But you know, I'm convinced that the operating room is not the only place that we can learn about disease, so let's get out of here. Michael J. Fox has really put a face to Parkinson's, and in 2009, he visited the Buddhist nation of Bhutan, high in the mountains, and up there he described a sudden alleviation of his symptoms. The shaking stops, his mind felt clear. But there was something odd to me, right? Because over his shoulders were the peaks that reached into the death zone, the place on Mount Everest where most accidents happen. In 1996, a group of eight climbers perished on their descent. It was the events from this that inspired the movie Everest that came out last year. You see, what most people don't know is that it's not from a lack of physical endurance that you die, but it's from your brain. First, you lose coordination, illusions set in, you become unconscious, and finally, you die from the cold. Now, one of the climbers up there who made it back said it was like I was drunk. I would have a word in my mind, but I couldn't figure out how to bring it to my lips. When you're in the second stage of hypothermia, you undergo what's called paradoxical undressing, where although your body is cold, your mind is telling you that you're so warm that you need to take your clothes off right there on the mountain. So you have people bumbling around, slurring their words, taking their clothes off. Is this a mountain or a mental ward? Well, despite the symptoms, despite the similarities, we don't know much about neurological disease. We don't know much about the wiring of the brain as we go up there, but there's hope. We're going to take an expedition to the Himalayas this fall. And we're going to measure the same brain activity that we do in Thomas, except we're going to do it on normal people using this head cap. What we want to know is why is altitude therapeutic to Michael J. Fox, enlightening to the Buddhists, but so devastating to the climbers? There's one more place I want to go with you. Let's keep looking up. We don't think that there's anything therapeutic to the body about being in space. As you're up there, microgravity sets in, starts to eat away at your bones, cosmic radiation seeps into your flesh. It's the ultimate death zone. 
I'm curious about what the brain does up there. Have you guys noticed that this is something on my mind? And it's something on NASA's mind, too. And do you know why? Mars, right? It's the next human frontier. It's where we want to go, but there's a lot of challenges in our way, right? It's harder than just building a bigger ship. We have a lot left to understand because when we get there, we want to colonize it, right? We want to set up a base, home sweet Mars. Now, as Elon Musk said, it's a fixer-upper of a planet, but yeah, we can make it work. But before we do, we need to know just as much about the brain as we do the body. Before we send someone like Thomas up there, and his hand is on the throttle of a ship blasting towards the red planet, and his tremor starts to come back alive. Now, you might be surprised to find out that we've sent someone into space with Parkinson's disease. His name was Rich Clifford. He had over 500 hours in a shuttle before he was diagnosed. He kept the symptoms at bay for four years until he took his final flight. His story is just coming to over the past couple of years. The problem is, because it was so hush-hush, we never asked the question, what is his brain doing as he's going up there? And in fact, we don't know much about the progression of neurological disease in space. You see, it's really expensive. It's really hard to do science on humans up there. So we need something smaller, less expensive, scalable, rapidly deployable. Well, here it is. It's called a CubeSat. It's a cube satellite, about the size of a loaf of bread. And inside of here, we can do biological experiments. And there's a team of us that have come together, physicists, engineers, neuroscientists. We figured out how to take cells from your flesh, turn them into neurons, put them into Petri dishes, put them into this small cube, send them up there. Now, it's the age of personalized medicine. And by taking cells from different people with different backgrounds, perhaps with different diseases, we can start to answer fundamental questions about how those cells wire and fire in space. So I love what I do. I get to show up into a lab every day and ask, how do I make people better? But it wasn't always so clear. In my mid-20s, I literally fled Silicon Valley in a tiny Mazda, headed back home towards Michigan, and all I knew was that I was no longer an entrepreneur. I was going to work on disease. But, you know, growing up, it was always the doctors who solved this kind of thing, right? So I had no idea how it could take me and fit it into this puzzle. But I learned something from startup world from owning my own business. The rules are very simple in that as they are in life. Let's wake up, be you, do good. Now the hardest one is the first one, right? I live in a Buddhist temple and we wake up at 5.30 a.m. every single morning. This is hard for everyone, right? Waking up is just hard, whether you're a student, whether you're a professional. And if it's Buddhism that wakes me up, it's biology that's taught me that the purest definition of life is movement. So get up. Be you. The poet May Sarton said, we have to dare to be ourselves, however frightening or strange that may prove to be. I promise you this, the best version of you is the authentic you. And finally, do good. Now, a lot of people, they like to replace this one with get rich, right? Wake up you get rich sounds good but don't let it happen it's a trick the gravity to all of your decisions should be do good now in that mazda i was just an engineer i was a guy who felt something special in the mountains one of those people who go outside on a clear night and instinctively just look up and you know i think that we all should be warrior poets right we take one single theme, something that brings us all to the front lines, but when we get there, we have to choose whether it's the rifle or the pen that we pick up to make the deepest impact. Because life really is a battle, and your character is going to be tested along the way. But whether you're a poet or a private, a philosopher or a politician, a physicist or a plumber, 
be that and do good with it. Because tomorrow's problems, they're not just disease. They're environmental. They're social. They're big. They're important. And guess what? They're yours. Now there's a space up here. It's for you. Wake up. Who are you? And what good are you about to do? Thank you. Thank you.